Can I keep this in my pocket? Uh, as long as it's on. Okay. All right. Yeah, maybe I'll put it here. Uh, open music. Is it earcom? A big yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, may, I know. <laughs> Never ask. That's not fair. Maybe, maybe, maybe after one leaves, I'll do the beginning, uh, beginning again. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so Open Music is, uh, was developed at IRCOM in Paris. Um, and so that has some, uh, you can actually write in Lisp, uh, and, uh, but it's primarily boxes that you drag around and connect to each other. It's really quite friendly that way. Symbolic Composer is uh, commercial. I don't know the current status of it. If everyone works with that, it's on the Mac. Um, but that is also list-based. And then SND and Overtone, uh, I just include because of the interest maybe people have in Scheme. So this is a, uh, uh, SND is a sound editor, also part of the Karma group um, with the Scheme interpreter, which is pretty slick. And um, Super Collider has this, I think, extremely recent uh, is overtone this um, environment and cloture? I would say by the standard of the other things we've listed, it's extremely recent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, a couple of, it's a couple of years old now. Like yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have to know how old the other ones are. <laughs> right, the other ones are pretty, yeah, no, common music is from the early 90s, uh, common list music. Open music, I think, yeah, maybe around the same time. Symbolic composer, I think, has been around. Yeah, so you're probably right. And if there are others, anyone know of any other list music things? Okay. Uh, so you've seen this. What's that? Nyquist. Nyquist is? Nyquist is X-list, both synthesis and composition. Okay. Good. So there's another one. What's that? It's Roger Danenberg. Oh, Danenberg. Okay. Good. Great. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So just, just to uh, show you just generally how music is represented here, um, there are, there are uh, 12 uh, pitch classes, what we call pitch classes, and in general for a lot of music, most music until some very recent music, um, sort of treats, for example, every C, every pitch C, no matter what its register, as being, as being importantly the same in some fundamental way. Um, and so it becomes useful to model uh, this. So, so I basically, when I'm working, I just assign, and this is sort of a convention, to assign uh, uh, the pitch C sharp to be one, et cetera. And of course, it's a mod 12 cycle there. Uh, for register, it becomes useful to, to name the registers. So between this low C here and the C above it, will all belong to register three and register four, et cetera. And so oftentimes I'll split apart pitch class and register so that I'll have, I'll, you know, I'll have a routine for the register, maybe distributing it in a certain way. And so these are just the different registers here. Um, and it's, it's usually, I, I draw on this a lot, but the convention is middle C is, is uh, MIDI note 60. And so I, that, I refer to that a lot. Uh, rhythm in general for MIDI, I think, but in, in, in common music is represented. Uh, durations are represented as um, uh, a quarter note at 60. There's only one second, so in fact these are, these are second durations of, of one second, one and a half seconds, etc. So the rhythm is like this. And then you just divide it using, so any tuplets would be divided using fractions. Okay, um, so uh, common music has a bunch of cool uh, routines. Here, I'm, I'm going to pop out actually and go to um, the, uh, the documentation for common music that I work with. Something called a pattern where you basically you define this kind of behavior and then I think it's a little like the Lisp, common Lisp sequence subset, um, but I'm not certain about that. So you define a pattern and then you ask it for values. And so it sort of keeps track of where you are. So you have a cycle where you just, for example, you have a, if I, if I create a cycle of, of the you know, numerals one, two, three, and ask for the next five, I would get one, two, three, one, two, et cetera, cycling over. Uh, and there are various other ones. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of these. Let me go back here. Um, 
Oops. So in, in um, particularly uh, dealing with randomness, there's a certain fundamental thing you sort of want to decide to do, and that is to, to either, uh, and this comes from probability theory, right, the idea of, of, of you know, drawing urns out of a jar, whether, you, whether each time you replace, right, these, mar you know, these, these, I don't know, what are these, socks out of a drawer, or, right, urns or whatever. Yeah, right, balls out of an urn, right. Um, uh, whether you replace them after you choose them or whether you don't. And so if you replace them, that means that they could come up again. And so uh, there are two ways of working that way. You could have uniform weights. So here uh, the, uh, the pattern is the, the weighting. And I've just asked for a few values from there. Uh, these, this is just C, D, E, F, G, uh, mini notes here. So you see it's possible to repeat. And it could even stick on a note, you know, according to it's simply just random. Uh, or you could weight the values and actually, uh, so here I have the lowest and the highest notes are 10 times as likely. So you'll hear just a lot of G, a lot of this, a lot of this, and then a few of the uh, notes in between. So, and then a few in between. And those can evolve over time and I found that to be quite powerful to sort of have these these probabilities change and more. Uh, or you could, each time you draw, you, uh, you draw a value out, that you, um, that you leave it out until everything else has been chosen, right? And so that, that creates a more unif uniformity, if you will, unless you have hundreds and hundreds of these, in which case things begin to even out. But here you'll sort of hear a, uh, everything is equally likely. So the, so the whole field is saturated pretty quickly. Um, and then, you know, so you draw everything out and then you, then you choose from all of them again. And so uh, the pattern there in common music is called heap. And a lot of languages have, you know, uh, music languages have something like this. Uh, I don't know, you, a, a lot of you are probably already familiar with uh, the concept of Markov chains. The idea is, um, for example, here I have the pitches C, E, and G. And you have a you have a uh, uh, a matrix of transition probabilities. So, for example, here, um, if I if my note that I've chosen is C, then there's half a chance that the next note that I choose will be the pitch C, uh, at a quarter chance E and G. If I if I go from E, then there's no there's no probability there's no chance that I'll repeat E, and likewise there's no chance that I can go from G to C. So again, and these can, these can uh, vary as well. Right, so you heard those, the strings of C's and that probably had to do with a higher probability, right, of C repeating itself. Um, one incredibly cool, and for some reason Markov chains seem to, seem to, um, I don't know, you get these sort of in, these sort of instant semi-impressive results with Markov chains for some reason. Um, uh, uh, musically, uh, there's an incredibly uh, impressive and, uh, and sexy function in common music called Markov Analyze, where you can just give it anything and it computes the transistor matrix for you, which is really powerful. So I can take Happy Birthday. Um, do I need to play it? <laughs> And so here I've not I've I've taken not only the pitch but a, a you know I've made a little a short you know list of the pitch and the rhythm and and whenever they um, so it computes how the how the transition goes so that you hear something a lot like it but not exactly little fragments of it. And it just wanders around forever, sort of doing something like it. Um, but not exactly, right? Um, and so, uh, and there are different orders, right? So you can have a second order markup chain, which would keep track of the last two things that happen and, 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 uh, and on and on. And each time, a higher order, of course, you get closer, you get larger chunks 
of uh, so it resembles the you know the source a little closer. Yeah. Is the the rhythm is that also being done? Is that just by the Markov analysis also including? The yeah. This is how I this is how I modeled birthday. You can do them. You can you can break them off separately. What I did in this particular case, right, was to make to make each node a pair. And so and and, and so it's the source. So it's the note and the duration together. If you and didn't how do they, that would be less recognizable because you, you can really hear that was. Yeah, exactly. If you um, split them, would be yeah, that would probably, if I split them, that's more like how I would probably think. You know, as a composer, would probably do something, you know, and see what the effect would be. Yeah. Um, it would pro yeah, probably wouldn't be quite as, quite as clear in terms of the motives that you hear that if you, if you broke it out. Because then it would be more random, and you'd have pitches that wouldn't have the rhythm at all that they had in the, in the original. So. so, you try to do this stuff on Box uh, there's a whole, actually there's a whole group of algorithmic composers who are really heavily into the idea of like modeling earlier music. There's a guy named David Cope, maybe some of you know of, who retired from Santa Cruz um, just a couple of years ago. Um, who, would, who was, yeah, he was one of the sort of the early American, or, I don't know, how would you describe Is he still going now that he's retired? I think, yeah, I mean he's still, he has a summer workshop, it's all in Lisp. And uh, and I think he's up to like Beethoven's Fifteenth Symphony or something, where he models, you know, he models these symphonies on, on on musical styles and things like that. That he's got up to a very far as he can convince Yeah, no, it's really pretty impressive. I mean, I mean, that is the only interest he has in it, is that is that kind of thing. Exactly right. Yeah, and there are some folks. Um, I don't know of any like jazz musicians per se, but a lot of theorists who are interested in jazz. Also try to are, are trying to model it and things like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, there's also rewriting systems, which is another pattern. Um, so you can have uh, for just the Morse through so probably the maybe uh, you've, you've you've seen that before. Um, but uh, so so any time so for each generation, each time you see a one, it expands to zero one and one zero. Uh, rewriting systems. Particularly like you know, game of life things work. Work. I've I've had a lot of great luck with that. Um, uh, that kind of thinking, particularly in terms of rhythm. Um, so then here I have a routine where I just pass it the rules, any sort of automata, um, and then uh, start with my init, and then and then the generation number. And so uh, if I start with one, then the fourth generation is this. Here I'm just mapping it to. Um, you know, one would just be an attack, and zero would be a rest. The pitch is just an ascending thing. So it's the rhythm there, da, 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 da. Do you see the breaks? Then would be where the zeros are. Okay. Um, so I mentioned before this this pitch class idea uh, was used pretty much for all tonal music. We tend to hear this kind of identity of C and G as being, you know, the important thing that we're listening for. Uh, in more recent music, particularly from France, the Spectral School, Tristan Murai, Gerard Grisé, some other folks, um, they're interested in, in going back to frequency, you know, to use frequency instead of pitch so that actually the heights of the notes are very important. And there's a certain characteristic sound to that, and I found that interesting to work with too. Um, so I have a few routines, uh, something I call EXP warp. Basically, I have a, a factor, and these are just the um, uh, these are just three, three uh, you know three pitches, and so what I'll do is above the bottom, you know a certain uh, uh, above a certain um, value, that I'll I'll uh, 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 raise it to the exponent, so one one you know one point one etc up to three. So you kind of hear this. It's not a uh, well, I don't know, it's just a certain different sort of overtone sound to it. I should probably add, I, I still drop everything into the, the Mod 12 system, so I don't do anything with detuning, and a lot of Specker composers are very interested in sort of modeling the pitch, where it's not necessarily an A, but it's some frequency, some quarter tone in between. Uh, I could also do the following, the spe scale spectrum low I have 
is uh, where I take this, these th same three pitches. I vary the bass note, and so, and I keep the top note the same, and so then the middle note changes, it's sort of scaled according to the distance between the top and the bottom note, so that it remains the same. So as the bottom gets wider, the bass will get, um, the middle voice will get wider too. And again, sort of the sound of it, I've... Found intriguing. Uh, yeah, so just briefly, scale spectrum low, I'm passing it so each time. Um, I'm, I have a tone row here that I've just placed into register three, and then, uh, and that's the note that varies, right? Yes? So I do understand this, um, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this whole page. Okay. Are they, are they chords? Yeah, they're still chords, right? And they still, so, they, but, they, 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 but the process, yeah, the process with which I'm working is no longer uh, uh, this identity of pitch class. It's rather, it's rather taking the pitches that I'm giving it, which are still these MIDI notes, and then going into the frequency domain and calculating distances or you know um, performing multiplication, and then coming back into three notes. each chord is three notes, correct? And the, and the, um, the, 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 I don't know, the difference in, 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 uh, in pitch uh -huh. among the different chords is all the same. Yeah, what I did what I did in the second one anyway was just take the bottom note. Okay, I have these I have this chord that I start with, and there's a certain distance between the three notes and the chord. So it's think of a rubber band, right? I have the top note which which never varies. And so I just stretch the rubber band from the bottom, and then the middle note will also waver so that it keeps the it keeps the distance, the difference between those notes proportionally the same. Oh. So, and the first one, um, basically the idea is that I raise it up to a power, so it's a kind of curve that goes up. The fr I raise the frequencies to a power, so it doesn't, so I'm not adding and subtracting um, pitch classes per se, but rather using the frequencies. And so, yeah, that way, yes. Yeah, right. Yeah, so I so I, so I wrap them back. So it doesn't. Yeah, I mean, it would be much. The uh, the difference in the sound would be much more apparent. I think if I was, you know, if I was if I was going only for you know for the for the frequencies themselves, then you really hear a lot of that. But I don't. I don't really do that. So, yeah. So and this you know this is sort of a tradition in French music. It goes back to Messiaen even who 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 would kind of work with modes and and uh, interested in the overtone series that way. Uh, also, I mean, this comes out of electroacoustic music, the notion of ring modulation. If you take any two pitches, then the sum and difference of the frequencies of those two pitches uh, can give you some, I don't know, just not very intuitive, so therefore kind of intriguing thing. So here I just, I'm feeding at these pitches, basically a chromatic scale up here, and then circle of fifths in the bass. Um, so that's, that's my source set. And then the result, which isn't necessarily either pitch, uh, sounds nothing like it. So I've had fun with that. Um, okay, so now I'm getting to some, some maybe just a, a small subset of the of the stuff I've, I've developed here. Um, became interested in optimization, particularly the traveling salesman problem. Um, and there's a great, uh, something called Concord. I don't know if anyone works with things like that, but it's a, it's a very fast kind of solver. And so I, and so I wrote something that would sort of pass, pass out to that and then get back the information. Um, basically the idea of the tra traveling salesman problem, right, is you have a bunch of cities a certain distance from each other and you want the best algorithm. You want the shortest trip where you're visiting all the cities. So I thought um, there is a musical analog to this, and that is you could have a bunch of chords, and the distance between, so all I needed to do was to find a metric between the chords, and, um, and uh, I could, and then it's a traveling salesman problem, basically. 
So, so my metric was if I have if all the courts have the same number of members, that for instance the top member, the number of half steps to get from one top member to the next, plus the distance between the middle members and the distance between the lowest members, right, would would be a metric. And so then I and once I had that, then I could I could um, find and then the output would be the best arrangement, the smoothest arrangement. So I move the least from um, from beginning to end. So here I just I spit out a bunch of notes in three note chords, random tri chords. And now here it is with the short after I've solved it using this routine TSP chords. So that just uh, manages to work. I haven't really found, I, I, this isn't in any of my music, but I thought it was interesting. <laughs> so, um, and mathematically, I don't know, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, I've been able to work with constraints. Uh, if anyone's worked with Screamer, maybe. Um, so this, uh, that's a constraint solver in, um, that works with common list. So I have a tone row. This does the random arrangement of all 12 pitches. Very slow. <laughs> and what I was interested in is getting from one pitch to the next, but I only wanted to use certain intervals, right? So, so uh, the only intervals that I'm allowing here are perfect fourth, la la, and uh, ascending perfect fourth and a descending major second. La, la. Um, only those two intervals were allowed. And so I had to find a way to get from one note to the next. You see I have a perfect fourth here, so it would simply go to the next note. But to go up a minor third would have to be some combination of plus, plus five and minus two. And, uh, and this I've, and this I've, uh, I've used. So we'll stop at each note, the C, there's the G sharp, so I've, yeah, so I've had some luck with that. Um, so this is like a music theory thing. Uh, basically, uh, there's, uh, there, there's been a lot of interest in music theory recently in the notion of how to, how to transform among triads. So I'm going to go through a little song and dance, be patient with me here, uh, uh, surrounding the concept. And then, uh, it's a way to illustrate some work that I've done here. Um, basically, you can go from any triad, you know, major, minor, chord, you might say, triad, uh, to, you can always get to three triads of a different quality, so starting from a major triad, a C major triad in this case. If I, I can take e each one of the members, if I lower, uh, you know, the third a half step, I get a minor triad. If I, if I lower the root a half step, I get another minor triad. If I raise the fifth a whole step, I get a third minor triad. And you can do the same thing with minor triads in a, in a similar way. You can get the three major triads that way. So composers have found this pretty interesting since the 19th century, really. They kind of built this, this is a fundamental region for a, what's actually a torus, where you can get from each one of these triangles is one of these triads. And, and so all 12 major and minor triads are represented here. And so you see by moving, what I, what I did in the previous slide was, for example, I started at one and I can move using any one of these, any one of its um, sides as a pivot to another and by a series of moves get, get from one, any, any triad, any major triad I want to, to any other triad in the whole, in the whole group. This in some sense what um, preserves the musical nature of it? Yeah, I mean part of, yeah, I mean part of, part of what makes it desirable is that there's a certain fundamental, there's a, there's a, um, there's a continuity in the musical language, right? And so, 
particularly triads. They don't need to. Be, they don't have to be uh, uh, major or minor triads, right? That tends to make a tonal, so you can use it for any harmonic set you want, and so that becomes important, even if, even, even if I'm not thinking tonally. So here I, uh, I, you know, so I modeled this basically, and so here I'm starting with a C major triad here and getting to a D minor triad, and so I'm, those are the two triads I'm passing to it. I just built sort of this wrapper thing, um, and uh, and so it goes through an A minor, et cetera, these different functions, and so you'll kind of hear it seems smooth and you know. Each one's a triad, just sort of moving up by step. So I thought that was pretty cool. I, I it's, um, yeah, I use the A star program, uh, although I go back and some of these paths are long, you know, then I, then I check it against what I have. And so this is, so I'm showing my, my greenness in, in lists. I'm not sure they're always the shortest paths, right? The best paths. So I need to go back and, and kind of investigate that. Um, it's just the, uh, well, I'd have to go back. I just, I just totally ripped off this A-star. I just load this A-star that I found. Um, but somewhere you have to define most of the best, right? A best, right, yeah. How do you define that? I think it is, I think, I think it has to, it's a function of distance, sort of, a uh, shortest path, probably. So, yeah. So, this just, it's not just a, a the shortest progression, like, it's almost going to be like the progression of chords. Yeah, I mean, I mean, basically, it's coming back here. The problem is just getting, like, I start on one of these triangles, and what's the best way to get to this other triangle there? It's not even a search problem because there are only 24, so you're... Yeah. You could, you could flatten the whole problem into a table. Really. Probably. <laughs> I, I probably should. Yeah, I probably should. But were they all major? Um, what's that? Were they all major? No, no. So it, they, they always alternate because you can never go from a major to major. Right, so it's major, minor, major, minor, major, minor. Whenever you're on a minor, you can only move to a major and vice versa. So, um, yeah, so, and there's actually, there was a dissertation on the music of Max Rager. I don't know if you've heard of him. He was a 19th century composer. Um, very interesting harmonically. So it's like a student of Brahms, um, a late tonal German composer. And, um, and kind of generalize this so you can use, so they don't have to be triads which I think is really cool. So they can be larger chords. And so I make use of that uh, also. I've modeled that. Um, this I found interesting because I, I uh, sort of, I became interested in the idea of developing a bunch of different transformations. The notion of somehow starting from a harmonic, harmonic object and then generating more objects from it. So I have one where, where, each, uh, where each pitch goes a tritone away and, and things like that. And, and then I can still use this this idea of the A star, right? Because if you have, you know, it's just finding a, a place then from one to another. Uh, okay, so then I have another thing here where um, I, in an earlier slide, I kind of mentioned this, but uh, sometimes with rhythm, I tend to model as, as a code, and so I can, and so I can draw on a lot of stuff from coding theory and things like that. This isn't really exactly that, but. Um, the idea that I, that I have a code word uh, that you see here, you know, uh, the rest in attack would be hmm, ta, 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 to uh, then the other one, uh, a code word, ta, ta, ta. And so I want to go from one to the next, but stepping through, so, so for example, from, from one to the next, I would either change a, exactly one, one to a zero and, or one zero to a one. So I'd either attack or I'd either add an attack or remove an attack. And so it's a way to sort of smoothly transition in terms of rhythm. You'll hear the downbeats in this low note and then the rhythms change above it. And so, and so that was, yes, yeah, so this is my starting code word here at the beginning and the other one at the end. And of course, it could be used for pitch as well. How do you choose the root randomly? Uh, yeah, pretty much, right, yeah. Yep. 
uh, became interested in the notion of, of uh, again, getting back to sort of the probability, stress probability. So I had this long kind of random pitch idea and um, I wanted to somehow express meter uh, probabilistically so that uh, I, would, I would build a stress vector where, um, where each, there's a certain base probability of one for every single position in the measure. Those of you who know about time point system and things like that, there's, there's these different positions in the bar. But downbeats are four times as likely as any one of those notes. And then the top of each quarter note is, is almost that likely. And then each eighth note. So it, so it, so it, it kind of it mirrors the, the, you know, the, stri the expected structure of meter. So you'll kind of hear this. Uh, the more you listen, you can kind of hear. I'll sort of conduct the, um, the meter here. But I've, I've, I've had some good luck with this. So yeah. So, and then there are a bunch of breaths where that happens also. So there's a certain, it's not simply entirely random, but there's a, there's a kind of flavor to it. And so um, I found that useful. Okay. Um, say what? Very 1960s. Yeah. Well, this probably. Well, before it was 1860s. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I kind of. I mean, I could. I could step through some some compositions or or whatever. I don't know. I've been talking a while and don't know how long people like to go or. Yeah. You want to hear more? Okay. Please stop me with with questions here. Okay. So. Um, I have a bunch of strange, and maybe I'll play some of it, some sort of electronic music, but, but I sort of started a side project a couple of years ago, and uh, I think it's good for maybe illustrating um, some, of the, some of the work that I've done. Um, so I've basically taken as my, as my source material uh, some pre-existing material, and these are just uh, hymns, chorales. So these Protestant four-part chorales. And so I take the whole texture, the rhythms, sometimes just the soprano line, but sometimes all four parts. And I'm not a particularly tonal composer, but I once I started writing these, I just kept writing. So um, and it's, it became very interesting for me as an algorithmic composer because you have to tell right away there are certain things, you know, and this is a very old, these were organ pieces I ended up writing. Uh, it's a very old tradition, right, to write, you know, chorale preludes on, on you know, hymn tunes, things like that. It goes back to Bach and Bach's Um But there's, there's a clear task. You sort of want to, you want to keep some of that identity there, right? You want to, you want to feel like the tune is in there somewhere, and you can kind of trace it out, but also um, to, uh, to have some variety and some complexity that you're, something you're adding to it. Okay, so this is the first variation. I have the score here if anyone wants to read music, but um, the first variation is um, I basically use this thing called S-play, and I always pass it two values. The pitch is up here, and the rhythm is here. These are just motoric um, sextuplets. Uh, that I use there. Basically, I take all the chords in it, and I have another transformation, like this, like this Tonitz idea, a way of getting from one chord to another. This is the Rager thing I mentioned. And then I just, uh, I have something called a smooth list, which basically means if I have a, a, list, a list of lists, then each list following the other, if there's a repeated value, I drop it from the second list. It just it just takes out some of the redundancy. So, so, um, and I, I make a lot of use of that. So you'll hear. So you kind of hear the harmonic. Um, 
you'll basically hear the harmonic content with some detours. strange detours sometimes. And the smoothness too creates a sort of unpredictability in terms of the rhythm as well, right? So sometimes because if there are repeated pitches then not everything is a quarter, you know, I'm not moving from one quarter note to another but things are maybe a little, you know, harmonic areas are a little shorter by one or two notes than other notes. So is there a reason you um, uh, yeah, you know, it's a very popular variation technique in the organ, yeah. So I wanted to vary the texture. This is a, there's a whole set. I've got 12 of these, and, and uh, yeah, that became appealing. So, yeah. So this is very commercial? Yeah, basically what it was, was, uh, it was it was the chords that I started with, and then from one chord to the next, I had the, remember that path I was tracing out between chords? I did that between every one of the chords. I mean, it's really neat because you can really hear the you can hear it, right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, it is. This wasn't me playing the piano. This is just, this is just, yeah, it was just a MIDI thing, and yeah, it seemed to kind of work for the, for the instrument. Like, notes that weren't in chords in the original, like there's a passing that comes between chords. Was the previous one just had other individual notes also the original? Yeah, I went from one chord to the next. Uh, let me see. Yes. Yeah, it was all, yeah, homophonic, what they say, so, so each, each voice moves at the same time. Yeah, there's no, there were no lines besides the chord. Yeah, it was all, all four part. Yeah, this is always four part soprano, alto, tenor bass. So here's another one. Uh, basically, I have a, uh, uh, the soprano, the soprano line now I put in canon with itself and um, had a certain routine for that, so things needed to match if there was a consonance, it would match. So if I have two lines, right? If there's a consonance between the pitches, then I'll match them. If there's a dissonance, I just keep looking. So it's this kind of funny, funny thing. And so then it becomes, then the texture of it becomes unpredictable. Sometimes it'll be one note, sometimes two or three. And so this, this I've had some luck with too. Basically, if I have, if I, if I have a texture that varies, then for example, if it's a three note chord, it lasts longer than a two note chord. So intuitively, that kind of makes sense, right? If you have, if you have, um, so that's what this is. So you'll only hear the top line, and then a little bit strange this with this canon answering because sometimes the product of two consonances is a dissonance. So there's some funny things that happen. So it's actually the same melody is starting at three different pitch levels, although it's a little hidden. idea there. Um, the Markov chain I use here, I take, the, I take the soprano line and so I model it within the, within the home key where the chorale was in, in terms of D major. So it's not just random pitches but it's rather do, re, mi, etc. And so I model that and so the, and so the uh, what you'll hear is the top line is entirely made up. Um, and so it's this top line modeled on the soprano and then below it Every five pitches and then every four pitch, you'll hear a doubling um, at uh, a, perfect fifth uh, a perfect fifth below. What do I do with the rhythms? Oh, basically, uh, repeated notes are uh, tied. So that created a kind of uh, a little variety rhythmically. Perfect fifth sort of gives it that sort of Aaron Copeland sound. Um. 
Okay, and you see it's a second order, second order Markov chain, which I'm passing to it there. Uh, okay, so I had this, this thing that I've, um, there was a theorist, Nicholas Slonimsky, he was also a music critic too, I think, um, has this method of harmonizing any line. A lot of jazz musicians are, are sort of into this, this thing of harmonizing with intervals. Um, so basically what I did is I took the soprano line and if you give it the first chord and the melody, it'll harmonize every other pitch in this, using this method. So I did that. So now I had a series of chords that I, so I basically reharmonized the soprano, have a series of chords now that I um, break out into three lines. So now, so now um, you know, in terms of register uh, with ties, etc. There, and each one, I have something called these lands, which I took the lengths, the, du the durations in the, in the hymn, it's a little complicated, but the durations in the hymn, and reproduced, the, scaled them out, so I multiplied them, but added a little fuzz, added a little randomness so that they, so that they don't quite line up uh, entirely. So you'll hear cadence points, stopping points, but um, you'll, you'll see the voices start to, you'll hear the voices sort of go out of sync. So this is the soprano line on top. And there's a... Um, the nice thing about this is that you can hear a kind of consistency. There's like this, the, these, these perfect fours and things like that. So the, the harmony stays consistent. But there's things kind of move. Um, Staggered, or a staggered way. Okay. Uh, here I've taken the chords, just taken them literally, so that's Lanka Pitts, they're just the chords from the, from the Lancashire hymn and basically use this, this vector for, for attacks. So you see the first note, for example, last five beats, and then the next four, et cetera. So it's this kind of funky rhythm that I just um, sort of mapped there. I changed the rhythm this way. Just the resultant of duration five and duration nine, if you think about multiples that way, right? So then five, nine, 10, 15, 18, 20, et cetera, as attack points. Prime numbers are your friend, if you're trying to write. <laughs> Otherwise, things just get too predictable and, and, and thumpy and everything else. Um, one, one thing, I don't know, maybe uh, those of you who, um, uh, in sort of recent music history, there's something called tiling, which is becoming very interested, a lot of uh, musicians become interested in tiling canons, tiling vectors. The idea is that here I have a vector where you see the arrows, the distances between all the ones, these are just indexes, but the ones, right, I, I have two next to each other, I skip two and I have another. Uh, so that same rhythm is shared with the twos, right, that have the same thing, same structure. The fours and the fives have the same structure. And the threes, this is pretty slick, the threes have the same structure but twice as long. So this notion of, of, of kind of, of, of interlocking these canons. So basically here I just took the bass, the tenor, three I made into a rest, four and five are the rhythms for the soprano, just taking them literally from the, um, from the melodies. And uh, because, again, the length is 15, we're not used to counting in 15, right? We're used to 16 and 12, so uh, it makes it... And we seem to change harmony roughly at the same time because each has three, so nothing gets out of sync in terms of the four parts. Those rests provide the, the rhythmic variety here. Seem to work.
you know, in this, this phenomenon of auditory streaming, right, where you hear, you know, if you, if you have a couple notes up here and you leave them, you come back, your, your brain puts them together and draws the connections there. It seems to kind of work with the, the kind of arpeggiation. What's that? Um, no, I, do, I don't work much with that, actually. So, yeah, and, and, and particularly for a piece like that. I mean, some of my electric acoustic music I will. Things get crazy fast and slow and stuff, but not, not here. Not for each variation, it tends to stay the same. Yeah? Are you supposed to be doing things to take advantage of the streaming or are you uh, just... I think the streaming... Not like that and you're happy about it. Um, no, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm kind of aware of it that, it, that it, can, it can play with that phenomenon, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. Not sure. Yeah. Did you write it that way because it's good, or is it good because you wrote it that way? It's good because I wrote it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, to say, you know, it's didn't something I invented, right? I mean, Bach, you know, I mean, Bach has in the yeah. So, um, and you could explain. I mean, James Tenney, for instance, has pieces where you have pitches that you know you sort of work with the phenomena itself. But I'm just sort of aware that. You know, you can kind of connect it. You kind of connect those notes, right? You hear this note repeats, and you hear it go down a step. And it it contributes to the the effect. Um, this is a little complex. Let's keep going. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. Um, so here, there's something called Chavinsky rotation, which I won't go into. But um, there's another branching process where I go from chord to chord. This time, yeah, actually, the sound of Stravinsky you may kind of hear here um, and uh, shuffle the pitches um, and the soprano lines in the bass. A very slow moving soprano line is in the bass. And uh, here's something also, something called ornadures, basically, is if I have, it's another way to treat a varied texture. If I have, if I have notes, if I have note lists of different sizes, I can have them, you know, as chords. Or I can take my quarter note, which doesn't change, and just take that, the length of that list as a subdivision. So for instance, if I have a four note list and a three note list, I'll arpeggiate it, ta 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 ta, that way. So you'll hear some of that. Um, Again, the harmonic language is a little more bent out of the out of the tonal world. Um, something similar going on here, uh, branching out again. I double it basically in these in these stacked fifths, and then and then branch those. Uh, then I take the I have something called closest mod list where I have where I basically I, I know that I have three note chords, so I want to make. So I want to split that into three lines, but I want to arrange each chord so that each line moves as little as possible, a little like the TSP, so that each line would move stepwise or, or um, you know, or just tie over. Uh, the attack points are, are using the idea of multiples of three, four, and seven. This rest class back, uh, back that I have here, strong sort of fifth C sound there. So it's based on the soprano line, but you know, a few steps back, right? A few, a few processes ago. Uh, finally, I just took all the pitches. We're in D major, and I just this is actually from Arvo Parrot. I got this idea um, of uh, uh, basically has this technique tintab tintabuli. Dave, Dave, am I pronouncing it correctly? Tin tintabulation. Tintabulation. This idea that if you have a melody and a mode. Right? You put those two together, basically you take the closest note in the mode to that melody. So this has this funny kind of modal, linear thing to it. Basically all I did is take each pitch and just kind of mapped it in this funny asymmetrical way. So 
throw out this funny Lydian sound. So, anyway. Um, so, I don't want to leave you the impression that, that all I write are organ pieces, so I'm going to... I'm just going to give you, I'm just going to flip around um, in a, uh, this is a CD that I have uh, that came out in Innova. This is a couple of years ago um, of my electroacoustic music. I have some here. I'm going to buy some. They're, they're $10 from me. Um, and let me, uh, so I'll just play some of these for you to give you some sense of what, why am I paused? You know. What's going on? Maybe I should pull out of my... Oh, okay. All right, let me bounce out of here. Yep. All right, so let me start and stop. Yeah, sure. Please. Yeah. I'm curious about your pro composition process. Um, did you more or less think these things out first and then write them down and they worked, or you? No, 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 no. No, I pretty much think I pretty much think at e at Emacs, and so I'll get some I'll get some notion, and then and then you see right there's a kind of embedding here, and that's usually a process of well, this is okay, but it's not really sort of I need it needs something. Slap on another thing. Yeah, slap on it, right, another transformation or some way to, some way to juice it up a little bit. And how many bit. did you sort of start and then even it and crash? Oh, it's the proportion is usually about 20 to 1. Okay. Yeah. I mean, oh, like, stuff I, I keep oh, like one, I, yeah, I keep, I keep 5% of what I think about or do. And that, that usually narrows down, like if I have a five minute piece, I'll usually have an hour of material and then, you know, whittle it down. Yeah. Well, what happens if you apply transformation again to the previous application? Uh huh. Um, then, then the then the uh, the branches just get longer, but right? Does it get less interesting? Does it converge to something? Um, no, not necessarily. I think here, like I had this template, you know, in the hymn, right? I have this template that I'm kind of working from. And so it's a kind of judging the distance I want from that template. Does that make sense? I have no intuition. So. Yeah. No, I mean, for me as a composer, starting from the source material. So the farther away I get, you know, if I keep transforming it, then that takes me further away. I'd need some, I would probably, my, my instinct would be, I'd need to find some way to then illuminate the connection if I'm, if I'm getting more remote. But it's certainly possible. I can just keep adding those generations. In fact, I do have that. I have this sort of recursive thing with branching that I could just keep going if I wanted. Sure. Yeah? Uh, you have some filters which are based on the uh, harmonization which are quite well defined, but you also show those based on Markov models. Uh, essentially, how are those came up? With? The Markov models? Basically, or? any other statistical models which are have been related to music, how would you think of that this might be a possible field um, Yeah, again, I've been sort of doing this a while, and so, and so um, the Markov, I have, I have a certain sense of when I'm now I think like a Markov, how it would, how, what sort of activity I, I, I might expect from it mm. somehow. So it's already kind of become musical to me and useful in some situations, maybe not in others. Yeah, but never entirely, and that's why I keep doing it, <laughs> right? So, yeah. So, you know, it, it, it stays interesting. I think we can play that while we uh, do, you know, additional years or whatever. But sure, yeah. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, when I, first of all, thank Drew again. That was awesome. Um, and uh, I don't think I said before my name is Brian. Um,
please uh, stick around for a little bit, have another beer, finish the pizza if there is still any left. Have to check. Um, yeah, just please leave that you uh, dispose of your garbage here all in the appropriate container. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions about this in my seat. Oh, if you'd like to present, I'm like looking around. I think five counting the room now, six people actually in the room have presented at Listen NYC, which we love. Um, and we have some good stuff coming up. We have a holiday party uh, in December. Details about that are forthcoming. Um, there's a, another presentation in January and February. Brian is presenting on types of stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got some good stuff coming up.